today I want to come to you real quick in regards to the Freedom of Information Act request or FOIA request. The quick part is I'll tell you what it's not. Then I'm going to tell you how to get around a couple of the reasons they may or may not object or kind of fight you on it. So take a listen. Coming from experience, I have issued or sent out, requested a ton of these. And the simple, the simple part is I've had a couple of them rejected for various reasons or attempts anyway. And you're going to later hear me talk about this again when we're talking about court proceedings. It's going to be referred to as a bond motion. And the bond motion simply comes from bond v. Rosen. Another one of the forms of the easy part of this is I'm actually not going to go into the bond motion or bond v. Rosen case until it's time for it for the most part. But we're going to go on again, Freedom of Information Act request. And again, it was signed into law on July 4th, 1966. And I'm going to read a portion of the act that reinstated it in the Open Government Act signed into law 2007. This act may be cited as the openness promotes effectiveness in our National Government Act of 2007 or the Open Government Act of 2007. The Freedom of Information Act was signed on July 4, 1966 because the American people believe that A, our constitutional democracy, our system of self-government, and our commitment to popular sovereignty depends upon the consent of the governed. I'm going to stop for a second because if you think of one of the movies that actually one of my favorite movies is called V for Vendetta. There was a time in the movie where he took over a radio station and he had a three minute and nine second speech which covered this exact section. Because we look at the loss of our freedoms, we look at the loss of basically our abilities through the tyranny that are set before through policy. And what happens is we're losing freedoms simply by consenting to policy, not law. So, again, something else I'll get into later, but let me go on. B, such consent is not meaningful unless it is informed consent. And I'm going to stop right there. Because there is a case that I'm getting ready to go through. Because when we're looking at these videos, when we're talking about certain laws, we forget that the beauty is we are still the masters through the entire situation. And unless they actually have evidence of a crime, everything is governed from consent. Okay, again later on in this series you're going to hear me speak about Brady v whoever in regards to a Brady violation but it's not going to be that Brady versus the six FBI agents this one is Brady v US 379 US 748-1970 waivers of constitutional rights not only must be voluntary they must be knowingly intelligent acts done with sufficient awareness of relevant consequences and circumstances. I'm going to also add in Brookhart v. Janice, 384 U.S. 1. For a waiver to be effective, it must be clearly established that it was an intentional relinquishment or abandonment of a known right or privilege. For the most part, when you're talking about waivers, the only way a waiver is actually effective, if it's written. If it's not in writing, it becomes a form of hearsay. But again, that's a court matter, and we'll speak about that in the next series when we're dealing with court issues. All right, 
when you're doing a Freedom of Information Act request, there are nine quote unquote exceptions that kind of restrict you even getting this information. One is classified information of national defense or foreign policy. Simple enough. Internal personal rules and practices. When you're dealing with internal personal rules, it gets kind of tricky, but if it's a part of a case, that'll also be something that you could have requested. Information that is exempt under other laws. Again, that's one of those gray areas because there are exceptions even with that considering depending on the ask, such as a 911 call. Technically, that's internal information, but if the call is regarding to you or your actions, it is free game. Four is trade secrets and confidential business information. Well, if it's a secret, well, we know we can't get that. Interagency or interagency memoranda or letters that are protected by legal privileges. These are technically communications between lawyers or doctors <clears throat> unless it's your information personnel and medical files that's again just like we just we just spoke about now seven is law enforcement records or information the exception is again there are certain personnel records that you can request such as salary that have nothing to do with the actual officer such as their social security number or something, you can't request that. Their home address, you can't request that. But there are, again, exceptions that you can request because they are a public service. Information concerning bank supervision. Again, that's FDIC information. But the exception would be if it's your bank information that you're requesting or your transactions. Geological and geographical information. That's one of those where it's depending on the request itself. So those are the nine no's. And as I've said, I've written many of them. And one of them um, that I wrote in court is called a motion to compel or the bond motion, which is the exact same thing as a Freedom of Information Act. I eliminate all of the extras or those reasons for not giving me the information I'm requesting. One is no record being requested is not relating to national defense. It's not relating to national defense, so doesn't doesn't apply here. It's no record is solely related to internal personal rules and practices. And again, using the word solely eliminates the personal record issue because I may be requesting personal records but it may be personal records that pertain to me so that's the exception no record is directly accusing someone of a crime it's basically for information that's all I'm asking for so there are no accusations attached to it because it's a request for information no record is information where disclosed would breach their privacy because the records requested are of public records. Again, no one's social, no one medical history, none of that. No record will harm or delay the proceedings. In fact, could prove to speed this matter along to conclusion where the absent could serve to prolong them. And it almost sounds there for most instances, like, again, a court matter where you're doing a motion for discovery. And that's where you're having a slight difference. That's why, again, this is a court portion of it, but not necessarily because what we're speaking about, the motion to compel is a court motion. Freedom of Information Act, that's an anytime motion. And no record will lead to financial stipulation or endangerment 
the stability of any lawful financial institution. Basically, I'm asking for information that regards to me and whatever situation around me and nothing else is outside of that. Understanding, go ahead when you're doing your requests. A lot of times I would also recommend using the court as far as if you're doing an open records request or a Freedom of Information Act request from, let's say, the police department, it will not hurt you to go and file it in either a federal or a state court under miscellaneous just to have that court stamp and get multiple copies. I recommend three to five copies and send them out not only to the, let's say you're, you're doing a police report, you're doing the filing at a police station and it's on another officer or has to deal with a, a legal situation that was created by an officer stop. You file it with the police station. I send copies out to other folks that are in charge. And I keep one, maybe two for myself because there are times where you have people that don't have the greatest intentions try to deal with you. And those copies come in handy. Believe me. But remember, filing them, getting them done, make your copies, get it stamped, send them out. Till next time.